Before railroads closed the gaps of our country, the Santa Fe Trail was our first and only commercial highway. While the trail was dangerous, the rewards were well worth it. Join me in discovering what life was like for travelers of the trail and learn some hardy pioneer dishes like venison and chestnut pudding and local bison stew. All for a taste of history. Wow, spectacular. I'm on my way to Santa Fe, but you know what? I have to make a stop sometime soon because I'm tired, I'm hungry, I want to get out of this carriage. And guess what? No bathrooms in the carriage. <laughs> there are three main trails in the United States, the Oregon, the California, and the Santa Fe. The Oregon and the California were immigrant trails. Those are trails that families use to pack up their goods and head to a whole other part of the country to start a new life. The Santa Fe is a complete different animal. This is an international trade route between the United States and Mexico. We're hauling goods to make money. Prior to 1821, Spain had a tight grip on its colony of New Mexico. Trade with the Americans to the east was forbidden and the population was lacking supplies and manufactured goods. Mexico has a revolution in 1821, and they boot the Spaniards out. And then that opens up that trade route uh, for the United States to Santa Fe. They were hungry for our goods. Traveling across unmapped territory, the journey to Santa Fe was long and treacherous, with no certainty of return. Desperate and in debt, a man named William Becknell, known as the father of the Santa Fe Trail, decided to test his fortunes on the frontier. When he returned to Missouri with incredible profits, word spread quickly that this was an opportunity to make money. More and more wagons start coming down the road to Santa Fe. Things that they couldn't get in Santa Fe, they were eager to pay whatever they asked for it. Profits were huge. They could make up to 10 times what they were buying for them back east. Once they got to Mexico, once they got to Santa Fe, not only could they sell, trade their goods, but they could sell their animals, they could sell their wagons. The Mexicans had never seen wagons like what the Americans had. Becknell's original route to Santa Fe, known as the Mountain Route, was only passable by foot and pack horse. His second, much more profitable route took wagons along the Cimarron River. Though much more prone to attacks from Native Americans, this trip was much shorter and easier to traverse. You know what? Traveling in a coach like that is very exciting, but it's also very bumpy. <laughs> it shakes you up really good, so it gives you hungry. People assume that the Santa Fe Trail is just one way, but we're hauling goods both ways. A lot of wool and thousands of mules were brought back from Mexico to Missouri. Before long, there's actually more Hispanic traders than there are white Europeans. The journey along the Santa Fe Trail took travelers around 900 miles from start to finish. The road was bumpy and many times crowded, so stops along the way were not only welcome, they were a necessity. Apart from a place to sleep and refresh the horses, some stagecoach stops would farm ingredients and prepare meals for up to 100 travelers at a time. We finally made it. I'm looking forward for some home-cooked meal right here at Mojave Stagecoach Stop. I am so excited to be here today at the Mojave Stagecoach Stop. Beautiful kitchen, great company, unique recipes. It cannot get better. I'm here with the program director of the Mojave Stagecoach Stop. Tell me, what am I going in for today? 
Well, you are at the last stagecoach stop open to the public on the Santa Fe Trail. And we are so glad to share some recipes with you that might have been eaten right here in Mrs. Mahaffey's kitchen. We're going to be making a venison and chestnut pudding, a bison stew. We'll be making some waffles and also a dried peach pie. The first thing we need to do is get some chestnut simmering. Taking off the stove lid, I can get my pot as close to the fire as possible. They need to simmer about three minutes. So while we're waiting for our chestnuts so we can peel them, um, we're gonna process a little bit of suet. This is the hard fat from around the kidneys of like a cow or a bull or an ox. Um, and it's got a really high melting point, which tends to make your pudding spongy. This is the raw suet. Yep, yep. I cut it up into small pieces, pieces. Mm -hmm. and then I've been letting it melt um, so that we can take out uh, the graves, which are all the bits that yep. are left. Strain this through some cheesecloth. These graves, we call them, those are the bits that we don't want in our pudding. What we're left with is a nice white, clear fat. That's what goes in the pudding. I'll set this aside to harden. Mm -hmm. um, and when we are done, we're gonna have a nice chunk of mm -hmm. hard suet. It looks like lard, yep. it looks like pig fat, but it's really, really hard. So before I put it in the pudding, I actually need to mince it up mince into up. little pieces. The chestnuts are ready. Yep. We just needed to soften them a little so we can peel gotcha. them yep. for the pudding. It's easiest to do this while they're still so hot. hot yeah. yeah. So this is a beautiful piece of venison. It's what they call the inside round. Let's take a look. You got the, the bone comes right out of here and it's a beautiful piece you can, for roast, you can actually cut it like this for steak, because most of the time they would use arts and ends scraps, but for today, for taste of history, nothing but the best, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm just going to cube this up into pieces yep. for stewing, and we'll cook this before it goes into our suet paste. This is all the venison we'll need, so we're going to saute this in a little bit of butter and get it ready for stewing. While the venison is cooking um, in a broth, just to stew it a little bit, we'll make a nice gravy. I'm going to work a bit more on our pastry. Gotcha. This is the suet that we um, processed earlier. I'm mincing it up nice and fine. It's hard, not yeah. like lard. It's a much like candle wax. More like yeah. that's a great yeah, that's a great comparison. Like candle wax. Yep. This will then be added to flour and water, and we'll make it up like a pie crust, gotcha. and that will hold all the venison and chestnuts in our pudding. So for our um, pastry, we're gonna use some flour. I'm gonna do about 12 ounces of flour, which is why I've got my scale out here. Mm -hmm. We need about four ounces more of suet. There you go. You're gonna work this by hand? I work it by hand. Yeah, it has to. Any, any time you take pastry and you mix it with food, it has to be cold because the hot would just break the, the flour It'll part. Melt. Yeah. So what I can do, I can put the, bring the venison stew over here and put it in this little... You could eat it, you could just eat it right now already, look at that. <laughs> Let's try that. Oh, great flavor, but it's going to take a little more cooking time, but no problem because it's going to be cooking in the dumpling, so no problem at all. I'm gonna roll out the pastry. We'll put the venison and the chestnuts inside, wrap it in our pudding cloth, and set it to boil. My pudding cloth is inside the hot water. I'm going to take it out and put down a layer of grease and flour, just like I was preparing a cake pan. When my pudding hits the water, this will help form a seal around so the dough. Later, if you peel it off, it comes along with the, with the cloth. Exactly. Yeah. This is like a modern day pan spray. So, so put, I'm going to put the bowl under the pudding cloth. Gotcha. Exactly. We'll put the pastry in the bowl, in the cloth. Over. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And then we'll put the venison and the chestnuts inside. Yep. Looks good enough to eat already, huh? Mmm. Now you close the whole baby up. And that's what's important. That's why you don't want to make it too thin. You don't want starch. any of that venison to leak out. You don't want any of the hot water to leak in. Got a nice sealed pudding there. Beautiful. When the pudding hits the hot water, the grease and the flour on that cloth will create a layer so that the hot water can't seep into gotcha. your pudding. 
It's really important that your water boils the whole time your pudding is cooking. All right, so here we go. We're going to put this in the hot water. Unbelievable. All this work. And we'll let that cook for about an hour, hour and a half. The bison are a foundational part of the prairie. They are the Johnny Appleseed that spreads the grasses of different varieties throughout the prairie region. There's a rainbow of life released and supported by the sacrifice of a single bison. All the critters on the prairie benefit. The Native Americans believed that if you treated the bison with honor and respect, they would produce in abundance all that was needed. The busier the Santa Fe Trail became, the more it attracted the attention of Native tribes, who were worried about trespassers trampling their grazing grounds, chopping down their trees, and hunting too many bison. They were the food source that was available. There were endless herds as far as the eye can see. And so anybody that was going west would have a ready supply of meat that could be taken from, just as the Native Americans did. But that became a much greater amount of taking than the uh, herd can support. Native American raids, in an effort to protect their land, became a grave threat for travelers on the frontier. However, by the end of the 1800s, the bison and the surrounding prairie were left completely decimated. Over the ensuing decades, the extensive work of national wildlife reserves, sanctuaries, and farmers have allowed America's national mammal to be reintegrated into the prairie of the Great Plains and the diets of the American people. So, moving right along, what do you got in front of me here, Carly? This is a beautiful piece of bison. Really common here in Kansas, especially as you head west. But for Mrs. Mahaffey, who's cooking something for her stagecoach passenger, she's probably going to say, well, this is pretty much a piece of beef. So we're going to do a <laughs> quick beef stew that she might have given to the passengers who were passing through her home. Well, you cut the, the buffalo, I'll work on the vegetable. And I'm going to try to help you quick and cut everything pretty coarse. Sure. Coarse meaning like yep. nice chunks. You can take the pot over to the to the stove already. A little bit of lard. Put some butter into it, yeah. Yep, a lard, butter, whatever you want to put into it. All right. Now we want to do that. We should salt it right now. Okay. And pepper it. So now we can just going to let it simmer down a little bit. It's actually a relatively easy recipe compared to the first one we made. And you see we got a nice little uh, deglazing going on here. And now all the vegetable goes into it. Some stock made for us already. This is going to put in right now. Here we go. Any kind of stock. Should we add a little bit of wine? Yeah. Okay. Before wine, I got, you know, I'm responsible for the outcome of this recipe. Otherwise, you're going to blame me. So let me see if the wine is any good. Wow, excellent. Nice and dry. Let me stick some in there. Mm. So you get a couple of cloves in there. A couple of cloves in Perfect. there. Perfect. A little bit of thyme. So you could anything that you feel like adding to it, whatever. Good heat on it. Twenty minutes, we're done. This is a really simple waffle recipe out of Miss Beecher's domestic receipt book. Um, it has no yeast, so it's it's risen with an egg and a little bit of saleratus, which is modern baking soda. Mm -hmm. And that just gives it enough fluffiness to work perfectly on our stove. So we're gonna start with a cup of flour. My recipe says I can put in a little bit of sugar. Stick it in the mortar and pestle. I can cut more sugar if you would. Look at that. Oh. We'll put a little of that in there, a little sugar. There we go. And some salt. I've got a little melted butter. And then a beaten egg. This is a little saleratus or mm -hmm. baking soda and that with the sour milk will create the chemical reaction to make it rise. That goes in there, perfect. And just a splash of vinegar to make my milk Curdle. sour. Mm -hmm. 
the baking soda and the vinegar together create a volcano, right? <laughs> the carbon dioxide is what makes Talk your waffle rise. Oh, just to get a whiff of that already, huh? Mm -hmm. Just a really simple batter. I want to make sure my waffle iron is really well greased so that my waffles don't stick. Yeah, it looks like you've got a nice, yeah. That should be warm enough, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think you got it. You're moving good there. I liked it. So the bison stew is done. The pudding has been boiling for about two hours and we're ready to take it out of the pot while we wait for the waffle to finish baking. I love that. This is going to be great. Look at that. Okay. Oh, look at that. Woohoo! All right. Oh, the flavor coming out of that. Whew. Here goes the flip. Per oh, gosh. Perfect. It's pretty good. Oh. It's pretty good. There we go. Your venison and chestnut pudding looks marvelous. Give it up. I can wait to dive into that because <laughs> I know I'm anticipating the flavors already. All right, next, want to dish out our little uh, buffalo? Sure. Oh, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful stew. And now I'm garnishing it with something I'm not too familiar with, so do you tell me. This is a little bit of whorehound. We know Mrs. Mahaffey had it. She turned it into syrup when people in her household were sick. We gotta see our waffle. Here we are. Wow, look at you. Stuck a little in the corner, but not bad. Beautiful. It goes without saying, there's a lot of passion in this food, you can you can you can feel it, don't you? Can we taste everything? Let's. So I gotta start I'm, with the pudding. Absolutely. Wow. Hmm. The venison loves the sweetness of the chestnut, and it's all packed up in there. Beautiful. The bison. Mm-hmm. And some of those good root vegetable. vegetables. What's nice about it is the vegetables are still in the forefront, and not forgotten, and not overcooked. So it's really good. Waffles? I mean, doesn't need no explanation. <laughs> Can I take a little piece Just of that? Just a little piece of waffle. Yeah, let me try that. Mmm. -hmm. Mm. Really beautiful. <laughs> the pièce de résistance, how I come from, because look how beautiful it looks. It just says to me, eat me. <laughs> that is sinful. Excellent. I have to thank you again for all the hard work you put in together and on top hanging with me all day. It has been a pleasure having you here at Mahaffey Stagecoach Stop and Farm. Best travels as you're heading down the trail. Camps Grove was one of the most important stops on the Santa Fe Trail because here was the last good stand of hardwood timber between Council Grove and Santa Fe. There was good water here, there was good grass. The wagons could come in here, make repairs. The existence of this large chance general store says it all. Forgot something? Well, this was your last chance on the way to Santa Fe, here in Council Grove in Kansas. The best defense travelers found against Native American raids was to travel in large enough groups that it wasn't worth their risk. The need to find companionship made small towns like Council Grove absolutely crucial to their safety. They would organize and a captain would be elected and he would be in charge of taking these wagons down the Santa Fe Road, deciding where they would cross, where they would camp. We have documented cases of 145 wagons leaving Counts Grove at one time. It quickly became apparent that traveling through tribal land would be much easier with the consent and sometimes even the help of its native inhabitants. Missouri Senator Thomas Benton, a known trail advocate who was keenly aware of how beneficial the trail was to the economy, convinced Congress to allot $20,000 to treat with them. Over the decades, this trade route not only saw the exchange of goods, 
but also the exchange of culture as our country continue to grow into the melting pot we see today. Surely, I'm so excited to be here. It's such a pleasure to have you here at the Charles Days Cafe and Museum. We love the people that come here, and you included. <laughs> <laughs> now, Walter, I'm going to share something very special with you. It's American Indian dressing and then American Indian salad to go with it. We'll put in the vinegar first because sure. that liquid needs to be in the bottom. That's sure. This is vinegar with the mother in it, uh -huh. and it is the old-fashioned vinegar, vinegar. Yeah, that yeah. has enzymes that yeah. help you digest things. When I grew up, my grandmother would take a spoon of vinegar after after dinner or lunch. Yes, you know? and that's how And it to was digest. basically also midamata and mostly like apple, apple cider vinegar. You know. That's yes, and yeah. that's what that is: yeah, apple cider vinegar. vinegar. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have our honey in there, and we need two tablespoons. Walter, I am stirring this because you know how it is to get honey dissolved and I'm stirring it in the vinegar. But you vinegar. know the flavor comes out of there? Yes, mm. yes. I'm going to put the salt in next because we want it to dissolve. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we're going to stir that. Just a, mm -hmm. a bit of pepper. Put an eighth yeah. in there. Let's, let's see. Uh, an eighth. Okay. There you go. <laughs> All right. You do not want to put the oil in until you have everything, everything dissolved. Everything dissolved. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're putting in the yep, oil, yep. and I have just the right amount here. And then basically you're gonna put it in the in the thing so you can shake it up before yes, you put it in the Yes, the purpose greens. of that yeah. is to shake it. You know, sometimes it's hard to stir enough to get it. That's why shaking is mm -hmm. used. I think it is good. Yep. All right, so we're gonna put some greens in there first. We're gonna take chives. Perfect. That's good. Now we're gonna put mint and peppermint, and this nice. is what makes this delicious. Sure, sure, flavor. Oh, you know that cool feeling of peppermint. Mm -hmm. Oh, I put a lot in there. Now we're gonna mix our onions in there, and we're going to have our salad made. This is why this little thing is really nice. See how that drizzle on there? Because it got those holes. I've never okay. seen. I've never, I've never seen a spoon like this. It's good. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. I'm just mm -hmm. gonna mix that in there. Mm. Gotta get that dressing all blended through mm -hmm. that lettuce. Wonderful salad. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Mm. It's delicate, but it has a uniqueness to it, yeah? What a great recipe. Welcome, Chef State. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the Hayes House here in Council Grove, Kansas. You know, I could not follow the Santa Fe Trail without stopping here. Gosh, how many meals were served here to hungry cowboys and the travelers, right? Yes, the Hayes House was built in 1857 by Seth Hayes, who was the grandson of Daniel Boone, and is the oldest continually operated restaurant west of the Mississippi River. Most likely was the last good meal they got for quite some time, what do you think? Oh, well, it was 700 miles from here <laughs> to Santa Fe. <laughs> that was quite some undertaking. Rumor has it that people like Jesse James used to ride out the trail and they would come here and stay. It's not a rumor, I talked to him. Oh, you talked yeah, to Jesse? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. He, he actually the one who told me I gotta stop here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so this, this building uh, played a crucial role in the development of Council Grove and the Santa Fe Trail. We want to continue to preserve the history, but, you know, keep up with the times. Makes sense. Just don't put the sushi bar in here, will you? <laughs> yeah, we're about, you know, <laughs> 2,000 miles from water, right? <laughs> That's why I'm saying it. Everybody talks about Kansas beef. Well, what else are some of the specialties that have been served here for such a long time? Besides the prime rib and the steaks, one of the best recipes that we love here is a comfort food, and that's chicken fried steak. Which is also steak, but properly, differently prepared. And, and there, look at that, Chef Stain got it right here. There you go. Guys. Fantastic. Some chicken fried steak. I tell you Down what, in. that's gorgeous. Mm. Nice flavor. Tender. Mm, beautiful. Steak and taters. <laughs> so I detect this is cooked on the flat top, not in the deep fryer that so many people do. This is the little McCoy recipe. And this gives you enough power to finish the rest of the 700 you, miles. <laughs> sustain you along the trail. That's yep. beautiful. Comfort food in its finest. All this for a taste of history from the Santa Fe Trail. <laughs> <laughs>